On January 15, 2009, U.S. Airways Flight 1549 struck a flock of geese shortly after takeoff, ingesting some of the birds into its engines. Uh, this is uh, Cactus 1539. Hit birds to lost thrust on both ends. It's returning back towards LaGuardia. Sorry, stop your departure. It's got emergency returning. We can't do it. We're going to be the husband. There were mostly only minor injuries, and the only fatalities were the geese. This was a freak incident, but wildlife strikes in general are actually pretty common. To keep these encounters from turning deadly and ideally prevent them altogether, the U.S. government runs entire departments dedicated to managing wildlife strikes, because the alternative can be a lot worse than what happened to Flight 1549. This work is critical, and there's a lot that goes into it. From habitat management to sequencing animal DNA to collecting a gnarly substance known as snarge. Oh, yummy. Gold mine. Bird one is entering the AMA. We paid a visit to JFK International Airport in New York to talk to Laura Francoeur. She oversees wildlife management operations for airports across the region. The main goal of the airport for managing wildlife is to manage three things, food, cover, and water. And if you can limit the amount of food, cover, and water on an airport, you can actually reduce the amount of wildlife that's attracted to it in the first place. Laura and her team work hard to make airports inhospitable to animals to keep them off the runway. Things like getting rid of trees that local species like and planting ones they don't, insect control and waste management. But sometimes there's only so much you can do. JFK, for example, is right on Jamaica Bay. It's surrounded on three sides by water which, even with mitigation efforts, makes it a prime location for certain wildlife to find its way onto the airfield. Right now, it's turtles. Oh, there's a terrapin right there. Oh, there's another one right here. Every summer, hundreds of diamondback terrapins descend on JFK's main runway, looking for a spot to lay their eggs. There's just a really rich environment, uh, wetlands, salt marsh, a lot of grassland, so it's attractive to a, a variety of wildlife because of that. The airport is also above high tide line, which makes it a great place for the terrapins to come out of the salt marsh to nest. Sometimes in large numbers, like in 2009. All of a sudden, we had 175 diamondback terrapins in about a two-hour window. We'd never seen so many terrapins all at the same time. We didn't know where they were coming from and why we had so many. Since then, Laura and her team have introduced special fencing along the runway that keeps the turtles from trotting out in front of a 747. But on occasion, they still find a way through. We don't know why, but some will come in from the west side and walk all the way across the taxiway, the runway, the service road. Every once in a while, you get a terrapin that wanders far and wide. When Laura finds terrapins, she scans them to see if they've been tagged already. It behooves us to actually capture those terrapins, mark them so we can monitor the population and then release them again. That way we can track them over time and determine if our population is growing, decreasing or stabilized. Of course, terrapins are a very seasonal problem. Of the 63 terrapin strikes that have occurred at JFK, all have occurred in June or July. Day to day, the most pressing wildlife issue at JFK, and all airports, is things with wings. Mostly what we're seeing are kind of common birds that you might see anywhere, not just on an airport. So things like ducks and geese, different types of waterfowl, uh, wading birds, um, starlings, pigeons, a few raptors here and there. Since 1990, there's been a steady uptick in wildlife strikes nationally. Close to 250,000 have been documented, most of them birds. Yeah, if you look at the the data in our database, you can see an upward trend of um, strikes from year to year. Now, I wouldn't say that's because of more species are being struck. I think it's a a result of our outreach activities, uh, just awareness of how to report and uh, easeability to report through our website and electronic versions. Wesley Major is an airport safety specialist at the Federal Aviation Administration. He manages their wildlife strike database. 
Even though reports are submitted voluntarily, the database has been pretty successful. Every year, the FAA publishes an annual report from this information that looks at national trends, what species airports and pilots should be on the lookout for, what the most common damage is, and the cost, both financial and human. It's a tool for airports to, to look at specific strikes and, and examine strike dynamics. And airports use the database to evaluate their um, wildlife management programs. Now, don't cancel your flights just yet. While there are a lot of strikes, most don't even cause damage. In fact, a lot of the time, pilots don't even know that they happened until after landing. They might find a hint of evidence on the aircraft that they hit something. But it's still important to report that evidence and find out what they hit because the next strike might not be so harmless. When we're collecting the remains from the aircraft, it's usually bird and feather remains, could be other wildlife remains as well. We can take those remains and send them to the Smithsonian Institution's feather lab. Those remains are called... Snarge. (laughs) Snarge, I think it means a combination of snot and garbage. (laughs) Carla Dove is the program manager at the Smithsonian's Feather Identification Lab. She's been doing bird CSI for the FAA for 30 years. The Smithsonian receives around 10,000 bird strike cases a year from all over the world. It could be uh, whole feathers or parts of birds, all the way down to what we call snarge or bird ick, which is the tissue in the blood that's wiped off of the aircraft. Large feather samples are brought to the research collection where Carla will match them up with specimens from the museum's study skins. The museum has over 640,000 of them, representing 80% of known bird species. This is a typical case of a bird strike that has some whole feathers. And the note on this report says that the pilot reported striking an osprey. To verify the pilot's report, Carla fetches an osprey from the collection so she can compare the feathers. You can see a very good match. But if a sample has no identifiable feathers, only snarge, it's sent to the DNA lab. Farida Dahlin, the feather lab's molecular technician, then processes the samples. After a machine extracts the DNA, it's PCR tested. If there's viable DNA, it's sequenced even further. The genetic sequence it spits out is checked against an online database, which shows Farida what type of bird was struck. But not all samples have viable DNA. This is stuff that's been maybe sitting on an aircraft for a while. It could be contaminated with heat, with fuel oil. Um, So those samples are still identified using our morphological tools in our toolbox. And that involves making a microslide from that snargy, icky mess. And lots of times there are little feather barbules in there that we can look at the microscopic characters and narrow that down to a group of birds. We may be able to determine if it's a duck versus a pigeon. Knowing what species are endangering aircraft and vice versa informs the strategies that wildlife biologists use. It can help engineers design better engines and windshields or help inform more accurate bird strike models for flight training simulators. It reduces the risk, saves money, and saves lives. And valuable information gleaned from the Feather Lab can sometimes be really surprising. One of the things that DNA has done for us is opened up our eyes to what kinds of things are really being hit. We are getting things like bats, for example, that pilots initially thought they were just hitting birds. This year, we even had a cicada strike. As more planes take to the skies, more bird strikes are likely to happen. And this work will continue to be more crucial than ever to prevent damaging strikes. One day, maybe, we'll find some way to avoid bird strikes altogether. But for now, Carla, Laura, and their many counterparts in the lab and on the airfield will continue to do this necessary work. I think one of the things that I've learned in my 30 years of working here is that we really don't know what these collections are going to be used for in the future. I mean, there were no no airplanes when this collection was being created. And here we are now using it to improve uh, human health and safety, uh, to help save birds. It's a timeline. It's a geographic, uh, global scale, you know, collection that is here for researchers all over the world. 
all kinds of passerines are involved in bird strikes. This is a little um, indigo buntings. We have beautiful scarlet tanagers, uh, song sparrows, uh, just about any common bird that you can imagine has been hit by uh, aircraft. We have somewhere around 500 different species of birds have been involved in bird strikes.